All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I know people are still getting lunch and that's perfectly fine. Um, just before I introduce today's speaker, a word about our next meeting. Uh, we actually are gonna skip the, the two-week meeting and the next meeting in March because it's spring break here at Georgia Tech in two weeks. Um, so we will not be meeting until April 11th. And our speaker will be uh, Professor Marta Hatzel from uh, Georgia Tech Mechanical Engineering. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have a, a visitor or a returning <laughs> visitor to Georgia Tech, uh, Professor Shalou Rakeja uh, from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Shalou got her uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at uh, Indian Institute of Technology uh, and then worked for a few years before coming here to Georgia Tech to get her master's and PhD in electrical and computer engineering with our very own Azad Naimi. Uh, sitting right there, um, and uh, then did a postdoc at MIT before going to NYU for a few years, and then joining uh, uh, University of Illinois Electrical and Computer Engineering in 2019, uh, where she is also director for the Center for Advanced Semiconductor Chips with Accelerated Performance, also known as ASAP, which is an NSF-funded UICRC. Uh, uh, and she also is a uh, grantee of an NSF Career Award. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you. All right, I hope you all can hear me. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be back here. I remember being here more than a decade ago, and my last presentation that I did at Georgia Tech was my uh, PhD defense presentation. Um, so today, what I want to talk about is my perspective on magnetic materials, and more specifically, antiferromagnets, and just argue that uh, despite um, you know uh, a lot of the challenges associated with antiferromagnets, these are still amazing materials to consider for future electronic applications. And before I get started, I want to thank all my grant sponsors that have allowed me uh, to do this research that I'm going to be talking about today. All right. So before I get started, I wanted to give a very quick five-minute uh, overview of my research. So I work in theoretical modeling. So a lot of the work that I do is focused on developing new simulation methods and new models for a number of unique applications, such as RF communication and low power memory and logic. Some of the studies that I've performed recently include uh, doing uh, spin charge coupling in 2D materials, topological materials, and spin transport in these sort of like um, nanostructures. And more recently, my focus has been on studying electron transport in wide band gap semiconductors. So here is pretty much all of the materials that I've been working on. So 3,5 and 3 nitrides, I have done a lot of work in photoconductive switches, which are important for pulse power applications, as well as high electron mobility transistors, which you all may be familiar with, these are devices that are used for RF communication. And then in the middle of this slide, you will see these uh, antiferromagnets that I want to talk about today. And more specifically, the antiferromagnet that I want to talk about are these manganese-based metals. Manganese 310, manganese gallium nitride, the cool thing about these uh, antiferromagnetic metals is that, that they have some very uh, interesting topological properties. Also very uniquely, this is a material, manganese 310, that I'll talk about that has a very weak ferromagnetic moment as well, which gives us a handle as an external user to be able to manipulate the order parameter. All right, so just a quick overview of my work in electronic devices and materials. So the work that I do allows us to connect technology with its use in circuits. And to be able to do that, we have built this modeling and simulation framework that is shown over here. So at the middle of this framework, we have these compact device models. These are called, uh, th these are basically based on physics equations, but they do require experimental data such as S parameters, IV, CV, in order to be validated and calibrated over a broad bias and temperature range. Now, uh, these compact device models can also be validated against these uh, TCAT simulations. 
So TCAD stands for Technology Computer Aided Design. So generally what one does is they try to understand how electrons are moving in a device and typical methods that are used are Boltzmann transport equation, which is obviously very uh, heavy to implement computationally because it requires complex Monte Carlo simulations. One could simplify it and use deterministic methods like hydrodynamics and drift diffusion. Now, speaking of uh, Boltzmann transport, I have a postdoc opening in my group to do Boltzmann transport simulations for gallium nitride and other wide band gap semiconductors. So if you're interested, please let me know. But eventually, our hope is that with uh, this sort of a framework, we get to these circuit level simulations and the output that we're getting from the circuit simulations can allow us to fine tune the choice of the materials as well as the device design so that we can uh, typically meet the specifications of the application that we're interested in. Now, this framework that I've highlighted over here is specifically made for gallium nitride, aluminum gallium nitride, scandium nitride kind of devices. And we also need some first principles calculations. I don't do these calculations in-house. We collaborate with a lot of external uh, people who are great at density functional theory calculations and electron phonon uh, couplings as well. So taking gallium nitride as an example, uh, we have been working with Air Force in order to implement a better and more scalable method to look at electron transport in gallium nitride. The method that we have is called FKT, which stands for Fermi Kinetics Transport. And I hope you all are listening carefully because I promise, David, there is going to be a quiz at the end of it. Um, so what FKT does, unlike most other solvers that you all may be familiar with, examples might be, uh, you know, many electrical engineers use synopsis tools, right? So Synopsis Centaurus is an example of a TCAT solver. What FKT does better is all of these things. It is able to capture the physics of hot carriers, which is very important for high frequency applications. It can incorporate full band structure of the device as well. And finally, what it also does really well is the fact that it can couple Maxwell's equations to transport, and that is usually not very easy with the commercial solvers that are available on the market today. We have demonstrated that this uh, FKT has a better rate of convergence compared to all of the commercial solvers, and our paper that appeared very recently in December was chosen as the editor's pick, which highlighted some of these crucial mathematical details of the different solvers. Our hope is that in the future, we will be able to expand the functionality of FKT. So currently, what FKT does very well is look at these three-dimensional electron gases in a structure. What we want to do is study nanowires, nanosheets, and even scandium-based high electron mobility transistors. So if people don't know, uh, aluminum scandium nitride is a ferroelectric. So what we want to do is build a device that has a gallium nitride channel with aluminum scandium nitride sitting on top of it. And the applications, of course, uh, RF electronics is the primary focus of many of the things that I'm looking into. Uh, but we also want to push the temperature. We want to be able to make sure that whatever models and simulations we are building are equally applicable at high temperature as they are at ultra low temperatures for some of the very interesting cryogenic applications. All right, so here is uh, a few examples of the devices that I've been looking at also apart from gallium nitride. So although gallium nitride has been you know, the main focus and 3,5 hems has been the main focus, recently we have a very small uh, SRC funded project to do uh, 2D reconfigurable devices. So I have a collaborator that fabricates these devices and these are all fabricated in-house. This is a hafnium oxide doped with zirconium uh, ferroelectric capacitor and ferroelectric tunnel junction. So we basically develop models for uh, some of these devices that are validated against measurement. So I will boast a little bit about our models. So what, is, what sets our models apart from what every, everybody else in the literature is doing? There are four key things that we try to respect in our models. The first is self-consistency. What that means is you have the DC operation of the device, but at the other end, you also have the transient operation of the device. For transient operation, it is important to consider 
all of the capacitive effects, displacement currents that would flow through the device terminal. So what we do is we try to build the static model jointly with this dynamic model or the transient model so that it can capture all of the relevant physics. The second thing that we do, which has been a pain in the industry for a very long time, is we don't have models that are applicable to long channel devices and short channel devices simultaneously. So we are able to capture the appropriate physics within one unified compact framework. And we also have very few sets of parameters. So for any model, we need to train the model, right? We need to know what the parameters in the models are. And to train that model, we have to do this multivariable optimization. So the bigger the space of the parameters, the more complicated this process gets. So what I try to ensure is that the models that we are building has very few parameters, for example, uh, 40 parameters, as opposed to the traditional models, for example, uh, that are available in the literature in the Compact Model Council would have 200 parameters. So it's, it's a very large set of parameters that people have to deal with. Um, and finally, mathematical robustness is quite important. Mathematical robustness means you have these uh, analytic equations. You want to put this model into a circuit simulator because presumably you're trying to build some electronic circuit with it. The moment you put it into the circuit solver, what the circuit solver wants is that your models, all the currents and the charges are differentiable to the nth order. And if you don't have that, then the circuit simulator will complain about it. And therefore, your circuit friends are going to come to you and say your model is crap, which may be so, but this is some of, one of the very important things that we've tried to ensure in our models. So with this, I think I'll move to the actual real part of my talk on magnetics and spintronics. So spintronics uh, is a combination of two words, spin and electronics, and it basically aims to utilize the spin angular momentum of electrons as opposed to their charge in order to build useful electronic devices. And at the heart of any spintronics um, device or a circuit is a ferromagnet, which is shown over here, and it contains spins that are aligned parallelly with each other. So what one could do is assume that a thin film of a ferromagnet behaves like a giant spin, and we usually refer to it as a macro spin. And the idea is that, that this orientation is going to encode the binary states of zero and one, and we need some method in order to switch the state of the magnet. So presumably one will apply some external signal, toggle the state, and apply a reverse signal, toggle the state back. So what are some of the methods that one can use in order to toggle the state? People can use um, you know, spin torques, magnetic fields, combination of these with electric fields and voltages. And the idea is that you know, the magnet is sitting in one of its energy basins. So you can think that this orientation corresponds here, and then you apply the signal and the orientation then kind of like moves on the phase space and gets to the other uh, equilibrium basin. And again, this is a very simplified view. The real picture is, of course, way more complicated. Now, the goal in my research has been to understand how this evolution is taking place. And generally speaking, uh, you would end up solving this first order differential equation. This is known as the landau lifshitz gilbert equation. What it does is it tells you, this is my m, this magnetization, and this is how it's varying as a function of time in response to all of the external forces that you're applying to the system. And one of the forces over here is this torque coming from the spin current, for example, that you've provided to the system. So generally, you would solve it, and you would try to figure out what m is as a function of time, and then do some performance estimates and so on. Now, the biggest application of ferromagnets has been in the context of magnetic memories. Can anyone give me an example of a company that's very successful in making magnetic spin torque memories? Any idea? Everspin? Anyone heard of it? OK, so Everspin is a company that is actually making some of these uh, memories. There are a number of other companies, but as you all know, memory industry is going through a lot of uh, issues right now. So I'm not sure how many people are actually 
um, still researching this at least for this quarter. But so that's a very important application. And then there are other applications as well. For example, one could use this magnet as a source of random numbers because if you look at this equation, you have this thermal noise term over here. So it could be argued that the evolution of the magnetization is going to have some sort of a stochasticity and that one could harness for building uh, random number generators and so on. All right, there are some benefits of spintronics. First is that, that these elements are highly scalable. They could also be more energy efficient compared to their uh, charge-based counterparts. And one could always argue that, well, even if you power down the device, the magnet is going to be non-volatile and store the state. And in fact, as I mentioned before, Memory has been the biggest kind of uh, killer application for spintronics, and here are some examples of very interesting uh, latest and greatest memories coming out of universities in Japan as well as in iMac. At the heart of all of these magnetic memories is this element, a two-terminal device, and this is popularly called the magnetic tunnel junction. It has two electrodes over here that are made out of a ferromagnet and this blue layer is a thin tunneling barrier like magnesium oxide. So what happens in this MTJ is you pass the current and you control the orientation of the second layer, which is called the free layer. And once this free layer changes, the resistance of the stack would also change. So the resistance could be a low resistance or a high resistance depending on how the ferromagnetic electrodes are aligned with each other. This is at the heart of all of the magnetic memories that I showed earlier. But interestingly, this element could also be used for a number of diverse applications in unconventional computing. Random number generators being a very important application, but we can also use it as a microwave oscillator, a spin wave emitter, detector, memristor, stochastic oscillator, and so on and so forth. So this is a very powerful, uh, diverse element that one could use. Now, in all of these um, devices that I've talked about, it's all about ferromagnets. So what about antiferromagnets? Now, antiferromagnets represent the overwhelming majority of magnetically ordered materials. In an antiferromagnet, the spins are aligned opposite to each other. So if I look at the system on the whole, there is no magnetic moment over here. So in his 1970 Nobel lecture, Louis Neal said that these are interesting materials, but useless. And in fact, I took a snapshot of his Nobel lecture. And let me read from this. Uh, Neil says, they are extremely interesting from the theoretical viewpoint, but do not seem to have any applications. Now, let me focus on the positive here for a minute. Interesting, uh, you know, uh, theoretically interesting. So what is interesting about this antiferromagnet? Well, first of all, it does not have any moment. So it's not going to generate these dipolar fields, which also means that an antiferromagnet is going to be immune to external magnetic fields. From an engineer's perspective, what that means is you could take this element and assuming you could build a memory out of it, you could basically scale it down and stack it very, very close to each other without having to worry about crosstalk, for example, right? And the other thing is that in antiferromagnets, the dynamics is very, very fast. In ferromagnets, what happens is we have to wait about a nanosecond for any interesting dynamics to take place. In the case of antiferromagnets, the precession frequency is in terahertz. So one could at least theoretically argue that it would be possible to switch this antiferromagnet in picosecond time scale. Theoretically, that has not been demonstrated experimentally yet. And even theoretically doing uh, the math behind it seems to be very complicated. And finally, these antiferromagnets, because of the way their moments are aligned, also have very interesting dynamics. They can switch, they can have oscillations, and in fact, they can have spikes, which is like you put in a current and the, the moment spikes and so on and so forth. It can also have a burst, which means that it can have coupled 
you know, a train of spikes, for example. So there are some interesting features, but obviously there are challenges, which has made it very difficult for us thus far to utilize these antiferromagnets in any useful electronic application. And that seems to be the status as of today. So what are the difficulties? First, the biggest difficulty is there is no moment in it. So how the hell are you supposed to image it? And how are you supposed to flip it if you're trying to change the orientation? And you want to do, one could say, well, why don't we use lasers to view the magnetic patterns? Well, as an engineer, what we want to do is we want to use electrically uh, uh, controllable methods in order to switch the antiferromagnet. And after it has been switched, we also want to detect the switched state using microelectronics compatible circuitry. The second problem is a little bit more fundamental. Even today, people are still arguing, um, how does the magnet, the antiferromagnet switch? We don't understand the physics fully, we don't understand the time scale, and we don't understand the robustness of the switching process itself and the role of thermal noise. In fact, everything that I will talk about today will be sans thermal noise, and it will also be under the assumption that I know this is how the magnet is switching, because I have to make a framework and start with some assumption. And my hope is that, that the models I start building from those assumptions have some experimental proof. As my very good friend uh, Tony Lowe says, theory is not real, only experiments are real. So hopefully, what my hope is that the models that I'm building have a very strong smoking gun experimental proof that this is what is going to happen. All right, so in my research, what we've been doing is trying to understand, can we utilize these antiferromagnets as showstoppers, as the main element in uh, spintronics devices? If so, then what would this device look like? What is the writing mechanism? What is the reading mechanism? And then finally, what would be appropriate methodologies and models in order to estimate the performance, including the energy dissipation area, latency of the device. I have a number of review articles. This is, by the way, a blossoming area of research. So if you're interested, this is the right time to get into it because everyone is super excited about the vast range of materials that are available uh, to basically understand. It, it's just huge. So I have a number of review articles. If you're interested, I'm happy to share my slides and you can take a look at some of these very interesting review articles. Now. Uh, there are some spintronic phenomena that are available to read the antiferromagnetic state. So first is magnetoresistance. What does this do? You take two antiferromagnets and you sandwich them and there is a thin uh, tunneling barrier in between. And depending on the orientation of the antiferromagnet, you might get a low resistance or a high resistance. Now you might have imagined that this is only theoretically possible it has not been experimentally demonstrated in pretty much all of the antiferromagnets that we know of. It has not, except last month, a paper came out in Nature which demonstrated the magnetoresistance effect in manganese tin, which is a material that I will talk about today. So that's the only material in which this has been experimentally observed. Then we have anisotropic magnetoresistance. These are all resistive measurements. What these measurements are doing is they are trying to understand how does magnetization affect the resistance of the stack. So in this one, essentially, it, this resistance depends on the orientation of the Neal order, which is the antiferromagnetic order and the direction of the current. Now this one, the AMR, this is a bulk phenomenon. It has been observed experimentally, but it is a very weak uh, effect. Uh, and then we have something called anomalous Hall effect. How many of you are familiar with Hall effect? Anyone? All right, someone's there. Okay, all right, so I'm not gonna get into, uh, if you're not familiar with Hall effect, you better be familiar with Hall effect. This is like one of those uh, basic things that you ought to know. So anyway, I'm not going to get into it, but the idea here is simple. In a normal Hall effect, what you end up doing is, you try to put a magnetic field, and that gives you that Hall voltage that people often measure. In the case of magnetic materials, the cool thing is, you don't have to apply any magnetic fields and you get this Hall voltage. Now this uh, Hall effect, I have 
anomalous Hall effect. So what is anomalous about it? Well, what typically happens is that this is an odd function, and therefore you're not expected to get this in the case of antiferromagnets. It should cancel out. But interestingly, in manganese tin, the material of choice today, this phenomenon has been experimentally measured. It occurs in this material, so it's a very powerful tool to look at MN3SN. And finally, uh, we have this thing called tunneling anisotropic magnetoresistance, same as the top one, anisotropic magnetoresistance. It's just that the structure is a little bit complicated. The effect is a little bit stronger than anisotropic magnetoresistance, but typically this last one does not uh, persist to room temperature. There are some challenges. I know that people have been trying to do that in materials like IR, MN, and so on. And then on the writing side, so remember, my goal today is to tell you how to write, how to read, right? So I've talk, told you how we can read. There are four effects. They were kind of anomalous Hall effect is the only one that is you know, looking promising for most of these materials. Writing can be accomplished with spin torque. Now, how does that happen? Let's go back to my favorite device, the tunnel junction. Two antiferromagnets with an MGO barrier in between. So idea is, well, you pass a current and then flip the magnetization of the second electrode. Does not happen in reality. No one has experimentally demonstrated it yet. And the reason for this is that in order for this phenomenon to occur in the case of antiferromagnets, you need commensurate heterostructures, you need perfect epitaxy, and you need ballistic transport of spins. So that's, that, those are very challenging to achieve in experiments. The second one is a nice effect. This is a bulk effect. So you have this chunk of an antiferromagnet sitting, and you don't need complex multilayer structures. Uh, this effect is called Edelstein spin orbit torque. Complicated name. I can't seem to remember all the uh, torques that are now available in the literature. This one is also called the inverse spin galvanic effect, in case you want to remember that. The idea here is you pass current, and that introduces this uh, non-equilibrium uh, spin polarization, which basically exchange couples to this magnetization and flips the magnetization. This one requires very specific kinds of materials and crystals, ones with broken inversion symmetry. Examples in which this has been experimentally demonstrated is uh, MN2AU, for example. So that's been done. And finally, the nice effect that seems to work is the spin hall effect, spin orbit torque. So you pass a current through this uh, green layer on the top. I'm not sure if it's kind of visible as green layer from the back, but I have this green layer. You pass a current that basically exerts a spin torque on this bottom antiferromagnet and flips the magnetization of the antiferromagnet. Now, the third uh, effect that seems to work very well, whether your magnetic material is an insulator or whether it is a uh, metal. So we want to talk about how to utilize that in the case of metals. So uh, pop quiz time, uh, what are the two methods that we will use to describe MN3SN for reading and writing? So I'll just remind everyone, for reading, we're going to be doing the anomalous Hall effect. For writing, we're going to be doing that last one. All right, so there are a number of antiferromagnetic uh, materials that I've been looking into. Um, so we have these insulators, nickel oxide and manganese fluoride. These are the poster children of antiferromagnets. So whenever we think of antiferromagnets, those are the materials. And um, they're pretty good. Um, they carry magnons, uh, chargeless spin waves, basically. But I'm not going to talk about that. And then there is chromia. Chromia is a nice material. It's a magnetoelectric material. Not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about not even CU MNAS, but I wanted to highlight this material here. This material is a metal. Now, this was the first material in which uh, electrically controlled switching of the antiferromagnetic order was demonstrated. At the time, when I was still a student, um, it was a science paper, and everyone was super happy about it. But later on, it was found that the signals that they measured were not related to the switching of the antiferromagnetic order, but rather to dual heating and atomic motion related to electromigration. Nonetheless, this set the stage for what we could expect in antiferromagnets and generated a lot of excitement in the field about uh, eight years ago. 
So now there is a lot of interest in manganese tin and MN3 IR. The cool thing over here, which I'm going to talk about, is if you look at this material here, I have made some atoms, and then there are those arrows on the atoms. Those are the moments that are in that atom. The cool thing is that this is a non-collinear antiferromagnet. What does non-collinear mean? It means that it's a coplanar system. Coplanar means all the spins are in that same plane, so the blue planes is where the spins are contained. And then it is non-collinear because the spins are not in a straight line. They are pointing at 120 degrees with respect to each other. These are also called negative chirality materials. And this chirality breaks the time reversal symmetry here, so it gives us some, gives it very unique transport signatures that are not possible in any other material. Now that I've wasted half of my lecture time to talk about the background, I want to jump right into it. What is so unique about this? So this is a unit cell of MN3SN. It's basically hexagonal, and it consists of this ABAB stacking sequence of the 001 plane. And in the plane, we have a Kagome lattice of manganese atoms. And it has a very weak in-plane and isotropy. So if you're not familiar with an isotropy, an isotropy just means the preference of the system to lie along a certain direction. Now, MN3SN is unique because you could stabilize this phase only when manganese is in excess. So you will need something like MN3.02SN. So some of those manganese atoms are going to replace the tin atoms. And if you didn't have that excess, you would get contaminated with MN2SN, which is not an antiferromagnet. And also, at uh, the Neel temperature is 410 Kelvin, which means that if you were to heat it above this temperature, it would not be a magnetically ordered material. And this basically has like this 120 degree uh, spin structure, which is what I'm referring to as a negative chirality. There are other kinds of, uh, you know, um, MN3SN structures that are enabled at low temperature, but I don't think anyone fully understands what's happening below 50 Kelvin or what's happening even in this helix antiferromagnetic phase. I'm not going to focus on these two phases, but I'm going to focus on this triangular antiferromagnetic phase. So MN3SN is unique. It's a vial semi-metal, so it has these vial nodes, but that is not important from an engineer's perspective. What is important from an engineer's perspective is this fundamental crystal structure and the way the moments, the spin is arranged in this plane gives MN3SN very large magnetotransport signatures. That's what we want as engineers. We want to be able to measure this electrically. And even though, if you look over here, it has a very weak magnetic moment. So it's pretty much antiferromagnetic, except for a very weak ferromagnetic moment, which makes this material very, very special. And it has some other unique properties as well, and it has a very nice anomalous Hall effect. So the first point here allows me to detect it, measure it, and the last point over here allows me to control it. So I have a method for electrical control, and I have a method for electrical detection. That is what I want as an engineer. No other material that I know of from the antiferromagnetic family satisfies these criteria as well as MN3SN does. Now, this notion that I want to drive that electrical control of magnetic order is at the heart of spintronics devices. That's what I want to get across. And there has been tremendous progress in MN3SN. I only started working in this material about two years ago, and there weren't a whole lot of papers available. But suddenly in 2021, um, a lot of nature papers started coming out. So this is a seminal paper, one of the first papers that showed something very unique. They, said, OK, let's put platinum under MN3SN, pass electric current through platinum. And somehow, they were able to see that this MN3SN antiferromagnetic order started having a chiral spin rotation. And how did they measure it? Anomalous Hall effect. They measured the anomalous Hall signal, 
and saw very clearly that this was undergoing oscillation. So at the time, we were building models. So this was one of the papers that we referred to for validating some of the work that we were doing at the time. And in fact, just a month ago, a new paper has come out in Nature which shows that one could build these tunnel junctions. So you have two antiferromagnetic electrodes with MGO in between. And depending on the relative orientation of the two antiferromagnetic electrodes, you could measure a magneto resistance, about 2%. You might think it's so small. Well, it's better than zero. Uh, previously, we had nothing. Now we have 2%. So hopefully, we will get better and better um, as time goes by. Um, it gets worse, yeah. It gets worse at room temperature. This is low temperature, yeah. Why did this happen in MN3SN and not in nickel oxide or any other antiferromagnet? It's because of that weak ferromagnetic moment that I talked about. It's weak, but it's finite, and that is what is important for us to control it. In fact, in MNPT, people have demonstrated about 100% TMR, but I'm not interested in MNPT. I'm interested in MN3SN, so I'm not going to talk about that anyway. So. What I want to do today is just talk about some of the models that my group has been developing to understand I pass current, then how does the spin structure of MN3SN change? And by change, I want to specifically look at oscillations of this. And what we do is we want to focus on the right part, how much current is required, what is the frequency of this oscillation, but we will spend just a little bit of time to look at readout. And then I hope that the models that we have can allow me to understand the relationship between the frequency of oscillation and the input spin current. Now, for people, I said when I started this lecture, okay, that you know, antiferromagnets have terahertz frequency. So obviously, when we started working, we thought, okay, MN3SN should have some terahertz oscillations. And it turns out that this material is so unique that only and only in this material, you could actually tune that frequency down to the gigahertz range something that's not possible with other antiferromagnetic materials. So my next few slides, um, I was told this will be like a broad audience of students. So I tried to cut down the math, but these will be a little bit, um, still a little bit dense, but let's, let's, let's see what I'm doing here. We have this uh, platinum, we have this MN3SN, I pass current, gets polarized, NP, and it basically affects the orientation of MN3SN. What I'm expecting is that those spins that I showed, the triangles that I showed earlier, they are oriented in this uh, XY plane. The way I have set up my device here is exactly the same as the experimental setup that I showed on the previous slide. Again, the goal is to ensure that whatever I'm doing, I can readily validate it, right? So that's what I did. So how do I start here? Well, the general uh, process is this. Whenever we start thinking about dynamics, step one is to write down the free energy of the system. Free energy is the energy that it would have in the ground state when it is not being perturbed. And so we have exchange coupling. If anyone remembers from high school physics, spins like this opposite dot product, that is the exchange. Then we have anisotropy. Anisotropy is the preference of the magnet to lie along a certain direction. And in between, in MN3SN, we have this unique term called DMI. Anyone knows what DMI stands for? I wouldn't know when, if I was a student. DMI stands for zioloshinsky moria interaction. So this is an interaction that says spins are going to be like that, canted from each other. And we know in MN3SN, we saw that spins were non-collinear. They were not anti-parallel fully. They were in a 120 degree spin structure. So that is that. That is step one, how my students start. Uh, step two is, well, you got that energy, put it inside your equation of motion. Now, for antiferromagnets, this is where all the debate comes. The equation of motion that I'm going to use is the same equation that we used for ferromagnets, the landau lifshitz gilbert equation. So a lot of researchers are still arguing that equation should not be valid for antiferromagnets, 
or sometimes they argue that it should be it should be fine to be used for antiferromagnets except that you have to change some terms in it to basically be commensurate with the notion of antiferromagnet. But again, I will start from this assumption assuming that it's exactly the same as ferromagnets. But the key difference is, now I have to solve this for three spins in, in MN3S. And spin one is like this, then we have 120, another 120. So three spins, and that has to be done self-consistently. So I, we don't usually like doing that. So what my students did was a very smart thing. They said, instead of solving for M1, M2, and M3, why don't we solve this equation for some effective vectors? Effective vectors are just some uh, algebraic combination of M1, M2, and M3. So the first one is small m, which basically is the average magnetization, and then we have some other staggered order parameters. But anyway, um, what, when we start with this, what we also do is we look at how these vectors are oriented. So if I look at the bottom figure here, what I see is that N1 and N2 make this 90 degree angle, and there is this small uh, in-plane anisotropy or small weak ferromagnetic moment M. This is what allows me to kind of control this whole dynamic. And what I also want you to appreciate is this spin orientation. It's 120 degree, but not quite so. Not quite so. It seems to be 120, but it has a slight deviation. And only one of the moments is along its easy axis, the other two are not. So those are subtle things that, will, you know, uh, that we have to remember when we are modeling all of this. So before we did anything, before we even solve any equations with time, the first thing is to figure out what the ground state of the system is. Interestingly, when we solve for ground state, we get six ground states. These are six minimum energy states of MN3SN. At any given time, it could be here, or here, or here, one of these states. And the six-fold anisotropy is very important. The energy difference between this and this and you know, all the other, it's small. And it's that smallness of the energy difference that allows me to very efficiently control this material. All right, and remember that the magnetic moment that I'm getting in this system is very, very small. So we had this framework, but we were still not happy with it. We said, well, the equations are looking very bad, so what can we do to simplify them, right? That's, that's the whole point. We want to come up with analytic models. So what we did was something unique. We said, well, we know that we had three effective vectors, m, n1, and n2. So why don't we represent n1 and n2 in terms of some azimuthal angle? We know that even when I'm trying to switch this system, n1 and n2 want to remain in the plane. They don't want to go out. So I can just define them in terms of phi. Phi is our azimuthal angle that I measured from x axis. So n1 and n2 are still perpendicular. You can quickly do the dot product here, and you can determine that they are perpendicular to each other. So now, we start with LLG. We simplify it into three equations, one for small m, one for n1, one for n2. Not happy with it. We further simplify it in terms of phi. That's what we do. And that's when interesting things start happening. When we write down the equation of motion in terms of this phi angle of this Neal order, we get the second order equation of motion. What is interesting about this equation of motion, everything looks fine, phi double dot, phi dot. Phi dot is the angular velocity. So in measurement of anomalous Hall signal, that is what you're going to be measuring, this guy. So this guy needs to vary with time. If phi dot varies with time, you can determine an, uh, an AC signal associated with this uh, process. What is unique over here is this sinusoid six phi term. So it's a nonlinear equation, very hard to solve analytically actually. But the thing is that, that this prefactor in the case of MN3SN is very small. It's only 10 to the negative four. To be very, very honest, we did not derive this equation religiously because what, when my students started working on it, he didn't get this sine six phi term, he did not. In order to get to that sine six phi term, you had to do some perturbation theory. And he was like, I'm not doing it. It's too much work. And that seemed to be fine for 
the time being because it's so small, right? So why bother with it? And I'll tell you why bother with it. So then after we wrote the paper, paper is out. I, I wasn't happy with it, but whatever. We go back and we were like, okay, let's heuristically argue that there is a sine six phi term. Let's argue, let's change the equation. Let's change the equation and then see what happens. So after we changed the equation, we wanted to determine this pre-factor, but we'll see. So this equation of motion, if you remember um, from early physics days, is exactly the same equation as that of a simple gravity pendulum. It's exactly the same. So here in this example, this pendulum is being driven by a damping of beta and a torque of gamma, and this has inertial motion. So what did we learn? We learned that the antiferromagnet MN3SN has similarities with classical motion of massive bodies that are driven by Newton's kinetic equation. That's what we learned, and we can solve it. In fact, when we have inertia, the system accumulates energy can switch very fast. So that's what we learned from this process. In fact, as I said, why is all of this important? This is important because the smallness of the term allows me to have a dynamic at very, very small currents, making this material highly energy efficient for spintronic applications. If you look at other materials, they require orders of magnitude more current, not MN3SN. And finally, because of the smallness of this term, which sadly we could not derive religiously, but we argued heuristically and validated it against full numerical simulations, it also shows that the um, dynamics can be tuned from gigahertz to terahertz. So in the last few minutes, I'll just show you what we did. So we simulated the terahertz dynamics. So what we do is we apply a very large current and we get dynamics at six and a half terahertz. So this is how the three moments, M1, M2, and M3, are oscillating on the phase space, and it's rather fast. Then I do something unique. I reduce the current to about 10 to the 5. It's very small, four orders of magnitude smaller. Will the system oscillate? Yes. And that's what we demonstrated. I apologize, this is very crappy. It's so um, slow that my computer has difficulty processing it. So this oscillation is actually happening at half a gigahertz. That tunability is not afforded in the case of any other antiferromagnetic material. And I know I'm running short on time. How, much, how many minutes do I have? Three or four minutes. Okay, uh, three or four minutes. So what do I want to talk about? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this, um, the, the low frequency oscillations. We want these low frequency oscillations, why? Because these are more energy efficient. I don't know of any microelectronics circuit that could detect signals at terahertz frequency. So this would be a little bit more appropriate uh, in the case of you know, building practical electronic devices. Because otherwise, we'll have to put so much current that we would burn the system down. So we actually did a lot more simulations, not very interesting, but we showed that the frequency goes as low as about 0.2 gigahertz, and then as you're increasing the current, it increases. If you look at this first one, that's what I said, an antiferromagnet shows spiking behavior. Here it shows kind of better, it's less spiky, and then as the current increases, it gets better and better. And the critical current in our case is 1.7 into 10 to the 5 ampere per centimeter, really a small amount of current compared to anything else that we've seen so far. Now, how do we prove what we've done is correct? So this would be my last closing slide, and then I'll have one more thank you slide in a minute. So how do we prove what we did was right? So what we did was, well, we said, okay, let's run our full-blown LLG simulation and estimate the frequency as a function of the spin current. So these dots are taken from simulations. And this dashed line over here is also simulation, but it is the simulation of the pendulum equation that I showed you. And they seem to match. But then you could say, well, you're matching one theory with another theory. Where is reality? Okay, 
I'll show you where reality is. So this is the paper that I keep coming back to. This is the 2021 Nature paper. This came out sadly after we wrote our paper. So we could not cite it. Uh, they did something similar in their experiments. They calculate the frequency of oscillation as a function of the input current that they are applying. And we see exactly if we account for the changes in the thickness and other material specific parameters, we saw that they got the exact same results as we got in our models and simulations, which gives us a lot more confidence in the things that we have been doing. And in the interest of time, let me just go to uh, my computer. My computer, so it's not gonna, it's not gonna, uh, well, I will tell you what I was going to say. So my computer is, when I was a student, oh, it came back. It came back. OK, uh, what I want to kind of very quickly um, do is this um, last slide. So there has been, let's see if it will show up. We will wait for it to show up. What I wanted to say was that the, I've talked about this rich set of dynamics, oscillations in MN3SN. So there is a lot of interest very recently in doing neuromorphic computing. That's not an area I work in, but a lot of other researchers are now saying that one could use these antiferromagnets and use their spiking nature to mimic the uh, action potentials of biological neurons. That's one very active area of research. And I've written some, uh, mentioned some papers here that have looked into this sort of uh, action potential behavior of antiferromagnets. And then they're also claiming that one could do some sort of analog uh, computing or you know, building some uh, logic gates with it using spiky inputs rather than DC signals, as would be normally the case. All right. so. With that, I'm done. So my group is very interested in working on MN3SN. We're looking into new textures and effect of thermal noise and heating and how does one couple one oscillator with another oscillator. So those are some of the interesting research topics. And I will remind folks, uh, if you're interested in a postdoc position, please let me know. I am getting a little desperate, so sorry for soliciting here, but uh, I thought I would use the platform to just remind everyone of that. And I want to thank my students who did the work and my collaborators and uh, our funding agencies. And thank you all for being here. Questions? Thank you. A uh, very practical question. So you have one of these configuration that you study where you have a essentially dielectric between these two antiferromagnetic materials. How important is the thickness of this uh, material? And you mentioned that it's important to have high quality interfaces like epitaxial growth to have any focalinear one, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They claim that the quality is not important because uh, the reason for this TMR uh -huh. is not what happens in ferromagnets where you have spin polarized currents transferring torque. The reason that this happens in MN3SN is because of time reversal symmetry breaking and Berry phase and so on. So the, the whole physics is different. Um, there are some theoretical calculations that sh also show that in MN3SN the quality is not important. You just need uh, thin enough, maybe two, three nanometers, fine and good enough. Yeah, but no other material has been like has shown this at all. So I have to read that paper more carefully. But okay. that's the claim. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Always at the far back. Get my steps in. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a, a I think maybe a really simple question, but the last couple of slides you showed on your your graph of um, the frequency versus the um, the plotted pendulum equation that there's a threshold current, and I was just curious about the wh where does that arise? Is that a, a quantum transition or is it something more? Yeah. So the uh, 
usually a thresholding behavior is very common in magnetic materials because you have these six equivalent basins of energy in MN3 essence. So the magnet is lying in one of the energy basins. So we always start from ground state, okay? And then what we want to do is apply a stimulus and then give it enough energy so it can overcome that energy barrier and flip to the other side. In any magnetic material, that amount of current that is required to cause this transition is proportional to the anisotropy of the system. In the case of MN3SN, the anisotropy is so small. That's the argument I made. It's very small. So the amount of current is orders of magnitude smaller than any other known antiferromagnetic materials. But it's really to just classically, it's just taking it over that energy barrier. That's what it's doing. There's no quantum transitions in my simulations. I don't understand quantum, so sorry. <laughs> Any one more question from anybody? All right. Oh, Azad. So very interesting talk. Um, so, so is there any idea about the energy barrier between these states? Is it that that energy barrier is pretty low, or it's about hundred joule per meter cube. Um, it's very small. It's very small. Very very so small. So then, then they, you know, if someone argues for ferromagnets, they can say we can make a very low energy barrier magnet, and then the current density for switching would be very low. Correct. Um, so the advantage that you consider here are these new features, like Correct. you can. You can tune the oscillation frequency Correct. and stuff like Correct. that. Okay. So you cannot, yeah, I think ferromagnets are very solid, so I can't replace them, unfortunately. But the benefit is bursting, spiking, new kinds of dynamics. So hopefully we'll find some potential use. And in fact, we can increase the current and increase the frequency. So the microwave signal generation should be good. Um, but the signals that we measure, like at least people measure, is very weak again, about 100 microvolts, if you're lucky. It's very small. So the yeah. argument here is not this is going to be a better magnet that we can no. switch it more easily. Just more it's interesting. It's more new, new, yeah. new functionality. Correct, correct. All right. Well, I think we are at the top of the hour, so we'll uh, thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.